sweet vermouth and perfect martinis, similar to a Manhattan with different types of vermouth within it. But it is a very good drink, and if I came to your bar and ordered a martini, I would expect you to ask me four questions to demonstrate your expertise in a martini. What would be the four questions that you would ask me if I ordered a martini? Up on the rocks. Up on the rocks? I wouldn't really like that because think about it. I mean, a classic. You think about a martini, it's a V shaped glass. It is an icon. I go to Sao Paulo Airport, Baku Airport, Hong Kong Airport, and I'm looking for a bar. I don't try and figure out what the Chinese for bar is or the Portuguese for bar. I look for a V-shaped glass with an olive. That is the glass that you immediately think of that has a martini in it. So you could ask them that, but really that's one of those yes but, shall we say. It's really only a modern thing that people have martinis on the rocks. So let's forget that one. What other questions would you ask? I can make a different martini for everyone in the, the District of Columbia. Different, sign, tiny differences, but four questions you would ask. Firstly, what gin would you like? Maybe even what vermouth would you like in it? And if you look at the history of martinis, actually, some martinis in the early days had bitters in them. So a dash of an orange bitters, a dash of a pecho bitters, a dash of bocas bitters would be acceptable. And to my mind, all a martini is is gin, an aromatized or fortified wine, and possibly a dash of bitters. Second question would be the James Bond question, shaken or stirred. But again, as bartending has become more serious, and I don't just mean because we've invented terms to get ourselves paid more and laid more like mixologist and cocktailian and drink smith and sultan of shake and uh, liquid technician and spiritual advisor. Somebody actually described themselves the other day to me as a cocktailogist. I really hope they think they're a bartender, because otherwise the meeting we have is going to be a very odd one. But as we've started doing research, we've started figuring out they actually bartend in different parts of the world. They've developed new techniques. This is an example of my life. I was sitting in Bratislava in Slovakia, having a training session on Japanese bartending from a very famous Japanese bartender, sitting next to a Mexican bartender who works at a hotel in Geneva. It's pretty international. And I said to him, just in passing, by the way, how do you drink your martinis? He likes, ah, oh, I like them reposado. And I'm like, what, with tequila? He said, no, what I do is I get my mixing glass, put my ice in, I put my gin, my vermouth, and I just let it sit there. I don't stir it, I don't shake it just sits and slowly, very delicately chills and dilutes. Because we've realized that when you start mixing cocktails, some are shaken, some are stirred, but when you shake a cocktail, the more rough you are with a cocktail, it does four things. It chills it, it mixes it, it dilutes it, and it aerates it. And if you aerate something, it starts to lose flavor. So a shaken martini, for example, tends to have a softer, less ginny flavor than a stirred martini. But a rested martini has the biggest ginny flavor of all. So you get rested. You guys, I'm sure, make Bloody Marys. Yeah? All make Bloody Marys? Bloody Marys is a difficult one because you would stir cocktails that only had alcohol in them because alcohol mixes together very nicely. That's why all stirred cocktails are seafood drinks, and Manhattans, martinis, things like that. Whereas if it's got fruit juices, juices, creams, eggs, anything like that, you have to shake it to force it together. If you shake tomato juice, it aerates it and becomes almost like fluffy and also starts to break down. So it breaks into the water content and the solid content and looks like shit. So how do you make it? Well, obviously the best way to make it is through a technique called rolling. And you can roll anything. You, you would put your Bloody Mary in here or your martini, you tip it up and you just roll it backwards and forwards. It's not as violent as shaking, so it won't break down, but it is less, it's more violent than stirring it. And it's a technique not people have seen before. So you see this, well, what the hell are you doing? This is how we make our martinis, or this is how we make our Bloody Marys here. So that's rolling. The technique I want to show you is a technique that actually developed out of Barcelona, a bar called Boedas, which is a thing called the Cuban throw. So I'll demonstrate that in a second. But the third question you'd ask is how much vermouth? Nowadays we think vermouth is a toxic waste product. A small amount, throw it away. Original martinis were two parts gin to one part vermouth. Actually, wetter martinis work better because they're not quite as well, really strong. You, you would sell two or three of them to a guest as opposed to just one or two of them, shall we say. They're not so strong so people, when they go into dinner, are not stumbling about and things like that. One of the best martinis that I've had recently, which I'll demonstrate now, is a drink called a Fiddy Fiddy. Half gin, half vermouth, with a dash of orange bitters. The la last question I would ask would be Charles Dickens. Sorry, Olive or Twist. Gunch. So, olives are fine. I personally think they're horrible. They're the testicles of the devil. They taste like gasoline soaked grapes. But some people do like them, and nowadays you can get, you know, Spanish olives, you can get 
jalapeno stuffed olives. I have a company that sells me 52 different types of olives. From green olives, the black olives, the stuffed with blue cheese, etc, etc. But obviously for let's say Tanqueray 10 with its citrus, it's going to do better with citrus. Lemon, orange, lime, grapefruit. And you saw the idea of the twist there. The fitty fitty, I'll make one for you now, is to say I'm going to throw this. And all we're going to do is take equal parts of gin, So, look at the size of your glasses here. So, equal parts of gin and dry vermouth. I like Noali Pratt. Why? Because it's slightly oily in flavour and texture. And also because it's slightly English. It's a French product. It's got, not called Noali Pratt. Silent tea, as you would expect with French. It's called Noali Pratt because one of the... Uh, Monsieur Noali, who used to make it, had a very, very attractive daughter. But he said nobody could marry his daughter until he worked for him for a year. But unfortunately, he was a bit of a tyrant, so no local French guys wanted to work for him. But an Englishman, Claude Pratt, came along, fell in love with the daughter, worked for a year, impressed the guy so much that he then gave him part of the company as well. So it's got a nice English story to it. But throwing, what you do with throwing is you're mixing it, you're chilling it, but you're trying to control the dilution because the more diluted the drink gets, you see the weaker it tastes. But we like the aeration. The aeration, combining aeration and dilution makes it taste very bland. You just aerate it, it gives it a different texture. So all you're doing is basically pouring it from one into another. Actually, Just so you can see from a visuality point of view, I'm going to use a Guinness glass, obviously a normal Boston glass would be good. So all you're doing when pouring it, you see, you're getting that aeration, those bubbles coming into it. But actually, of course, you're going to do it in a slightly flash away. So you start to hold it all the way up there. There you're really starting to get some good aeration, and they get really good at doing this.